Hey, well, welcome to the Davidson Hang podcast. I'm excited to bring to you one of my my best friends, Aditya Gute, who is a public speaking performance career coach, and uh, or is it a career performance coach? Whatever it resonates with you, man. But I call myself career performance coach. Got it. Okay, career performance coach. And yeah, I'm excited to to bring to you. Uh, I think you'll learn a lot about authenticity, and uh, he's such a wonderful speaker, very well spoken, intelligent, and yeah, I think he he lives a very inspirational life. Uh, guys like traveling the world, like just doing so many cool things, and you just bought a house in Puerto Rico too, right? Apartment. Apartment. All right, all right. Yeah. yeah. Don't sell yourself short, man. This, this guy's. <laughs> So excited to have you here. Thanks, brother. And, and of course, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Davidson. Uh, one, of, one, of, uh, one of the very few people I admire a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, yes, uh, he just, um, him and, and a lot of the guys, one of my, uh, my men's group, he, they just created a video for me and, uh, it was very touching. I actually cried during it. So, you know, really appreciate like your friendship and yeah, I think a lot of the listeners will enjoy a lot of the lessons that, that you've had in life because you, you know, you, you've done pretty well for yourself in corporate America. You've gone through some coaching programs and IPEC as well, which, uh, I know my friend, Chris Wong, uh, he who was my first coach, like before I get like the first coach that the guy who introduced me into the world of coaching, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to to see like, you know, how you plan your life and and how you're able to just uh, be an entrepreneur and and then how also would love to see how you structure your time to build all those videos. Yeah, I think that you create a lot, but then you also do everything with ease and grace with a lot of, it seems like, like very easy for you. Like, it doesn't seem like you, you necessarily like, cause I think a lot of people like they, they, it feels like they try really hard, but it seems like for you, it's very natural. Thanks, man. Um, wow. Uh, so babe, would you like me to get started with uh, the questions at uh, the would love to learn a little bit more about like why you chose IPEC, uh, the coaching program, and how some of those lessons still apply, even though, you know, it was what, like a year and a half ago? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, you know, IPEC, um, first of all, I had an experience of coaching when I got coached by Neil Gold's team. He's a, uh, he's a, uh, one of the peer coaches uh, in the same coach training school that Davidson also went went through. So um, after seeing the transformation of my wife uh, after she went through coach training school, um, which I originally dismissed as you know nonsense, <laughs> and after seeing her transformation, you know I hired uh, uh, I hired, hired uh, Neil Goldstein. And within three, six months of working with him, I was able to achieve more uh, goals than I've achieved in my 10 years of my life. Wow. And more importantly, uh, in the sense that I always wanted to, uh, you know, speak confidently to executives, connect with people better. These are some of my real goals. I mean, uh, I was never pursuing them because I ne never had clarity on what I want. So I not only got, um, I got, once I got clarity on what I want, I was able to achieve them. Uh, through coaching um, and also I learned something powerful which is uh, that I always wanted to do what Neil did to me is to help people get clarity on their vision and pursue their goals uh, help them pursue their goals and that's what coaching enables uh, someone to do um, and, and then at that time I decided uh, you know what all my life this is exactly the kind of experience I'm craving for uh, and that's what Neil provided to me. So mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I made a decision. I want to pursue coach training program. Um, and initially, I've looked at uh, several schools, including accomplishment coaching. But the time I decided to coach training program, accomplishment coaching had full bookings. They did not have any spots left. So the next option was for me to go through IPAC, uh, which is the school I went through. Okay. 
And and uh, to switch switch gears a little bit, like, what do you think your secret power is? Like, what do you think it's something that you do very effortlessly that many others would consider hard? Right. I, I think you know. You know, I love uh, speaking in front of people. Uh, I love uh, whether it's uh, being in front of the video or uh, or speaking in front of like hundreds of people. I think uh, I enjoy that process. So I would say I would rather do do it effort. I would do it effortlessly compared to uh, many others. Uh, so. Yeah, your videos are really good. I I think you've been pu- like just pumping out videos, and it just seems I'm just like man, this guy's like he's trained. It's like you're born <laughs> for sure, like ready to like just you know just just uh be in the spotlight and be able to influence and and change people's lives. That's awesome, man. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm curious, what made you choose Puerto Rico? Uh, I think many of us dream of a life uh, outside of the U.S., but many of us are afraid because we're stuck in our comfort and and we we like predict. Most people like predictability, right? It almost goes against the human natural fight or flight mode to to uh, just up and leave and go to a brand new environment where you know many people would be afraid of that. Yeah, great question, man. Um, and one of, it, it's really hard to make a you know a decision like uh, moving to a whole another place where uh, English is not the first language, and deciding to like make a, an investment in a property and deciding to live there. It's definitely a huge change, and definitely by using pure logic, it's hard to make a, such a decision. As an engineer, I'm always like you know thinking about pros and cons of every situation. But something like this, a big decision like this, uh, often can be made through pure logic. So what helped me make a decision like this is definitely intuition. Um, When I first uh, came to Puerto Rico in 2017 or 16, uh, I don't remember exactly when. Um, Yeah, it's probably 16 or something. Um, I I felt a connection to this place like I did like I didn't experience with, with any other place. I love the people, uh, the ocean, and the fact that it's part of America. I mean, it is America too. And, and all of these things, uh, you know, uh, created some kind of connection to this place. Hmm. And uh, I remember in 2019, when one of the couple said uh, they had an opportunity to work remotely and they settled down in Connecticut. And I'm, I, I told them, like, now, why would you settle down in Connecticut when you have the opportunity to live every, anywhere and work from anywhere? Yeah. Why didn't you go to Puerto Rico? Uh-huh. What is the question that just came to me? And I don't know why it came, occurred to me that I asked them the question. Hmm. Um, and now when I had the same opportunity to work from anywhere, my original plan was to just keep traveling around until I find a place that resonates with me. And, uh, uh, and I've traveled in Southeast Asia and you know, several other places around that region. And when I came to Puerto Rico, I just uh, intended to plan, stay here only for two months. Mm. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I, I started to having a feeling of missing out on something because I had to leave in a month or two. And, and I totally enjoyed being here. I was going surfing every day. I was meeting people and enjoying the food. Um, and, and, uh, and in terms of the business um, you, you don't have to pay a lot, you know, the taxes, uh, you don't have to pay a lot of taxes that you typically pay in the United States. On top of that, uh, my insurance, uh, health insurance is like $400 for two people, something that you can never get anywhere in the United States, in the mainland. So logically and intuitively, it all made sense to me. So I had to take a leap of faith. And of course, uh, logically, everything hasn't been figured out yet. But intuitively, I know this is where I want to live. Um, so yeah, that's how I made it. This. How does how does one who is let's say their default is more analytical, more logic based slash engineering based, where you need you need a game plan, you need the steps, you need the action items, like everything figured out. Like, how does someone get out of their head and, and more into their hearts? Great question. Um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult process. Um, 
because those, especially someone like me, who's, who's, uh, who's an engineer, it's, it's a very survival-based um, role because most of us became engineers because we can have a steady job, right? And that's the primary reason. There are very few people uh, in this industry who became engineer because they loved uh, math, mathematics and hmm. they love uh, problem solving. Right. Many people would say that. I mean, I would also say I love problem solving, but that's all bullshit. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> right. So, um, so I think you know, and the main reason most people became engineers is mainly because they can have a steady job. So, coming from that mindset, it's hard to not have fears and trust your intuition. And and, and I I think in order to tap into more intuitive sight, it's less. It's more about acquiring a new skill than it is about reducing some of your fears and, and trusting your own gut uh, and, and trusting that you, you have the answer, that trusting that things will work out uh, in spite of the uncertainties. But, uh, but, but the more fears you have about uncertainties in the future, the more fears you have about something bad is going to happen, um, it's, it's hard, it gets harder to tap into intuition. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I, I do think our childhood determines a lot about our career, right? So, I mean, not to generalize because there's always exceptions to the rule, but most likely if you're into computers, you're into video games, you're into like you're more introverted in nature, right? Like just, just the fact that you like coding, you like being by yourself and you like being able to, um, you know, that, that, that tends to attract more of a introverted person who's going inwards, right? And um, so- if you're if you're super extroverted and you like public speaking you like like meeting people like um then you know most likely than not you'll go into more client facing role right like a more people to people role right so I, I think that does make sense um thank you and uh, what where would you say you lead towards do you lead more towards um intuition, intuition or logic um it's interesting. So I took one of those uh, Cliff uh, Gallup Cl uh, Clifton Strength Finders test uh, the other day uh, last week, mm -hmm. and I think you do change a little bit. Like you said, you gain new skills, right? So I was very surprised to see that. Well, my number one is is influence out of the four buckets. I thought it would have been relationship, but it said relationships actually number three for me. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. But it said strategy is actually number two for me, um, which I think is interesting. So yeah, so it said that um, strategy is my second go-to, and I was, but in an analytical, it's like my last. Like out of the out of the thirty-four different options, it said analytical is my thirty-fourth. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> What's your first? It says a uh, woo. Woo. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? Woo is like, like uh, for networking purposes. So woo is like you, you, you have a really good first impression, uh, essentially. Like you win someone over, like you, you're kind of like charisma, I would say. Dude, that is so true, man. I, I'll, I'll tell you one experience. Um, you know, the first time I visited accomplishment coaching as a, um, as an observer, right? You know, they have this late live training for the students and, you know, you have uh, guests sitting around as observers. And I was an observer. At that time, I didn't know you, right? You know, that was, that was the time Pan and you were on the same uh, class in that accomplishment coaching. And I saw that there's one Asian guy, you know, in that uh, accomplishment coaching. And that was you. At that time, I didn't know you. And uh, there was some powerful coaching moment and, and you were crying uh, and, and you cried. I don't know if you remember that I was sitting in the audience, uh -huh. uh, but, but, um, but I remember that face. I mean, it was very inspirational and moving. And the fact that you had the courage to even cry in front of like over 50 people and most of them are strangers, yeah. that was yeah. like, you know, pretty impactful to me. Uh, and uh, of course, afterwards, I met you, and then I knew that all right, you know, these guys. Uh, I, I knew how cool you were. So that just brings me to another question. Like you know, we one of the topics we want to discuss is, is authenticity, 
uh, and, and it's hard for men to cry. Trust me, I've been in coaching, trying to in, in, tapping into my intuitive side, but it's still, I can't cry. Uh, <laughs> so, so tell me, you know, what, um, uh, what helped you tap into that vulnerability and being authentic and not being afraid to be, be who you are? Yeah. So the video, so for example, the video that you all made me um, really touched me because, you know, if someone was to ask me like, what's the thing that you're proud of the most? Like most people would say like, oh, my kids, my marriage, my, like my career, my jobs. But I was actually, I would actually say the fellas like is the one thing that I'm the most proud of right so far, just cause like, just to see you all come together and the vulnerability, like it's beautiful, you know? But um, just seeing that all of you have shared gratitude and have like, and when Juan David was like, yeah, man, like you, you're like a role model to me. And I was like crying when I heard that, you know, and then my sister, you know, we didn't really have like the, you know, in the video, she was like, yeah, you know, you've, you matured a lot. You've grown into this, like, you know, you're a boy who used to pick on his sister's. And then now you're, you're a man who, you know, like we respect and, you know, you're, you're like leading the way, but it was really touching for me. Cause like, for me, I just, I just felt the love and the sincerity and the like authenticity. So I guess, um, I, I, I think it's tough, right? Because I, I think men, you know, I, I do think there's the society thinks that we should be like stern and we should be security, like comfort, sometimes financial security too. Right. But I think the, the men who show that you can be multifaceted, like you could be though the masculine energy, like me where like I get shit done and I'm in sales and, you know, I, I do business and, you know, I make money, right. That yes, there's that component of me, but equally as important, like, I'm the type of dude who's like not afraid to hug someone or, you know, to even with my wife, like, you know, I'll be able to, you know, kiss her like in front of her forehead, in front of my friends. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, I still want to be the same and uh, I don't really necessarily care like who's watching because at the end of the day, like, if you don't like that, not everyone's going to like me, you know? That's powerful. So were you always like this? No, definitely not, man. I was afraid I was voted most reserved in the yearbook. Um, wow. When was that? This this was a long time ago. This is in fifth grade. <laughs> okay. So so were you also uh, vulnerable in times of crying since you were a kid? Or was that did that change? I cried, yeah, I cried a lot. Like even as a kid, I cried a lot. Like like when my pup, my, my dad gave away my puppy, I cried like so much. I was like devastated. Um, so I was, I was always like a crier, you know, I think, but yeah, but to do it like in front of a room of like 50 people, maybe, maybe not like when I was that young. And what would you say is the shift that happened? Um, I think accomplishment coaching, actually, similar to, you know, when you went to IPEC, um, that was a really big shift for me because in that program, I cried 180 days out of the 365 days that year, which, which, which is a lot. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's powerful, man. And you also told me your coach, right? You know, you told me the number of times your coach made you cry in the calls. <laughs> Jason, for, Jason, yes. So, you had, uh, so your wife and I had the same coach yes. and literally he would just like stare at me. Like he wouldn't even say a word and I would just cry. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's powerful. Like that's how, you know, like he's a good coach. Like that's, that's a state of being that just like you can just be with anything, you know, it was very, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember the, the when I, graduated from IPAC, I was still practicing my coaching skills and you volunteered to be my uh, client. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and then one of the things, uh, one of the feedbacks you gave me is, dude, you should, you got to sh uh, shut up your mouth for, for a few se seconds because you're not giving me space to express myself because I would throw one question after the question and after uh -huh. question. 
Yeah. And and that's a powerful feedback you gave me, which which I, I've taken seriously. And 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 you're right. You know, there is a, there is power in that pause, and power in holding that space. Yeah, it's it's something that I struggle with too. Um, and uh, it it is very powerful. Um, and sometimes it's awkward. Like I have a client now that, you know, how the, the last part is like, what would you like to be acknowledged for? So yeah. there's always this really uncomfortable five <laughs> seconds where he just looks at me and he laughs. And then, you know, I just sit there and I just, you know, look at him and then it's like really uncomfortable for those five seconds, but then he comes up with, you know, things that he would like to be acknowledged for. That was definitely a challenging question. When Neil asked me, I'm like, what do you mean? What I, why would I acknowledge myself? That was a very strange uh, question for me. Um, but then I eventually got it. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and I would love to hear like what authenticity uh, means to you. Well, actually, like I'm curious about authenticity in marriage, right? Because I, I do think marriage is one of those interesting things that you spend so much time together that sometimes like, you know, obviously you married them for a reason, but there's always, everyone has little ticks and nuances and things that um, can bug like each other. So I'm curious in the context of marriage, like what being authentic means to you? Great question, man. And <clears throat> we both have a lot of conversations around, uh, you know, our relationships. Uh, so um, authenticity in marriage, that's a powerful question. What it means to me. Well, um, Obviously, authenticity, you know, the definition of authenticity, right? You know, I, I'm reminded of one speaker who gave a really good def definition of authenticity. It's being yourself, whether you are uh, closed closed inside the door or you're out outside of the door. You're, you're the same person, whether they put you inside the room or outside the room. And that's being authentic. So it's being, it's being transparent, which means, you know, um, you know, you're expressing yourself authentically, and and here is how it plays plays out in relationships. Then, then most of the times, you know, conflicts happen in the relationship when there is a disagreement on something. You have said the, you know, I have I might have a certain expectation on my spouse, and when that is not met, that's when the conflict happens. So the first thing, the first reaction that 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 comes out of it is uh, anger, uh, right? You know, because my expectation is more not men. My wife said she's gonna like, you know, make me something, prepare food and she did it. She said she's gonna, you know, uh, come with me to my friend's place. And she says, you know, she's, she's in a headache now, you know? And I'm angry because, you know, she didn't do something she said she's gonna do. And what authenticity really means, be, behind the anger, there's some other feeling. A feeling that uh, of hurt, a feeling that uh, you are unable to meet a certain expectation of yours. And it's your expectation. It's not someone else's expectation, right? And that feeling of hurt and being able to tap into the reason behind the anger is what authenticity means to me. And, and then you can tap into that hurt feeling and you can express that in a vulnerable way. And Davidson, you're great at it, right? You know, and uh, there's no anger when, when you can tap, tap into that deeper feeling that you uh, come up with. And I think that's what authenticity means and that changes everything in a relationship uh, because it's, uh, uh, the other person is much more likely to respond and you come from a place of, hey, I feel hurt that you mm. did this and stuff. Damn it. No, you always do this. I, you know, you come up with uh, stupid stories that you have a headache every time we have to do this. I know you didn't want to do this. You did this last time and you go on a go off on a rant, which is what I also typically do many times, right? Uh, um, and and but but if I can tap into something deeper than that, uh, the conversation can actually move forward and uh, and we can uh, can maybe arrive at something which is more of a win-win situation. That's that's deep. 
Yeah, I was laughing about the headache thing because uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but someone that I'm very close to <laughs> uh, always has a headache convenient. <laughs> then I'm just, oh, okay, there's a pattern here. I'm noticing this headache thing come up, you know, in, in certain situations, uh, predictable. But, you know, it doesn't help when you say that, you know, like it never makes the headache go away. It, it, <laughs> it's like you're making my headache worse. <laughs> I, that, I, that's exactly right. I mean, and the headache is gone when she wants something, right? <laughs> There's no headache. She wants to eat some Chinese food. The headache is gone. She wants to watch the movie. The headache is gone. I'm like, what happened to your headache? You just said that you have a headache and so you couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, I, but in seriousness, I love what you said about like just being able to communicate like our hurt, right? our needs as well. You, you know, for me, like, I don't, I, I don't always, t I hold it in, right? I don't always say like, hey, um, you know, it would mean a lot to me if, you know, X, Y, and Z, and then here's why. I'm, I'm missing the here's why. I think I, I assume, like, they know the why, but I can't assume, right? Like, just because I think they would know, doesn't mean like they actually know. And I think, yeah, it, it's tough. I think relationships like can be um there's a lot of um like past that influences the relationship right so that there doesn't leave a lot of space for like that person to change or that per like sometimes like i'll be assumptive i'm like well if this is the stuff that I, i've seen in the past then i can just safely assume it's like logic it's like well x you know a plus b equals c and situation a has happened before situation b it's going to happen in the next hour so i'm assuming you're going to be like c always and it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for them to reinvent themselves or for them to change if that's what i'm putting in their space already you know yeah totally man um and and what it reminds me can i share a quick uh, example um uh, that's coming to my mind yeah. I was uh, just, you know, speaking to a client, um, you know, who's also going through a relationship breakdown and, um, you know, the, her, her husband uh, cheated on him uh, and uh, still uh, she would like to continue the relationship because she's afraid of losing her husband. She doesn't have the trust. And she, what she told me is that she doesn't care about having or gaining more trust because the, the way typically it works in you know especially in Indian marriages is that mm. um, you know we, we we don't like to get divorced. Divorce is a big taboo mm. thing. Uh, you get so so even if the husband cheats, uh, you still want to continue with the relationship uh, because uh, nothing can be worse than a, a divorce. Mm. So the woman uh, was uh, com compromised. And saying that I don't need to create any trust. I'm okay. My husband, I, I just want my husband back. Uh, somehow the husband still doesn't want to be with the woman wow. uh, because his ego has taken a hit because everyone knew about it. Uh, so husband is seeking a divorce. And what, what the, the way it relates to the previous point you mentioned is that the lady, the woman in this uh, example, thinks that uh, the only way to move forward is to compromise, uh, saying that uh, it, trust, building trust is not important. The more important part is, um, you know, having her husband get, get back into the relationship. And that's the only thing she was able to say because hmm. of the previous beliefs that, the, that, that she had. That there is no other way than, that, that, that maybe, you know, they could have a hard discussion, right? You know, a tough discussion around this topic of divorce and losing trust, why this happened, getting into the, you know, you know, trying to heal from that process if they choose to, uh, versus trying to compromise because um, that's the only thing they were always used to. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that kind of reminded of something that even happened this week for me, where one of the things that she challenged my belief is that you know, in my belief, like all of my past is like, well, family was not there for me, you know, like that, that left, like didn't tell us a word, you know, I wasn't close to family, it was independent. So then she challenged it, me by saying, like, 
well, you know, if that's your, your, your mentality, then that's not looking good for our future family and our kids, you know? So it's like, if, are you willing to like get over that and like move on? Or are you still going to hold on to it? You know? And, you know, that's, that's powerful, you know, cause, cause like, it's like, oh, okay. If I still relate to my friends is greater than my family, that doesn't leave that opportunity for me to really have that like full authentic family connection, you know? So that, yeah, that was huge. Um, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I feel like no matter where we are, like we're still working on something, which is the beauty of um, coaching, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, unless, you know, we do all have certain default patterns and only uh, once we can break those patterns and have the willingness to see something else, that's when new possibilities happen. Uh, so I'm curious, just uh, because you brought up uh, this uh, thing around um, uh, having no family, right? How, what, what was the impact of that and what, what's the new possibility you created when you stepped out of it? Yeah, I mean, I think like the first thing that I had to do was, so the step one was like, just forgive myself even like just because of my story it was like oh i wasn't like a good brother or wasn't a good son but these are stories you know like these are and what happened because of that sorry to interrupt why did i say why did i tell myself these stories yeah i mean I, you know because you were telling yourself you were not a good son mm -hmm. what happened because of that oh yeah yeah like to your point to our points about like self self-fulfilling prophecy right so if, if I'm going to tell me that, like, no matter what I do will never be enough because I'm still my, my, in my mind, I'm like making up for lost time or I'm, I'm, um, so yeah, there was just a lot of stories that weren't empowering because the stories were like, oh, well, you know, even if you, I guess like for me, um, the impact was that I felt like disconnected from family, but you know, so some of it like was internal and then it became like external, you know? Um, and then I realized from our conversation, like, okay, like um, the thing that I was running away from the most, which is like to create a new, like a family and to have kids, like I was running away, like getting distracted, going to all these networking events, like more focusing on my career, but that was actually the thing that I wanted the most but I would never tell anyone that like, I was afraid, of, I was afraid of that, you know? So the impact was like, yeah, I just didn't prioritize like our relationship as much as I, you know, would like to. Shay, right. that, that's super powerful. And, and uh, that's another um, thing that can block us from being authentic, right? Our past in your case, uh, the story you're telling yourself that you, you are not a good son or, yeah. or not, not a good family member is is making avoid things even though that's something you deeply wanted yeah yeah and, and unless you address that it's hard to tap into your authenticity that what you really wanted is being around with people being around with family friends that's powerful man. yeah man um i think that's the beauty of coaching you know like you you were someone who was way logical, analytical, process driven, structured, you know, it's like, Hey, if I work this much, I can make this much, I can use this much, I can buy this house, like, you know, very like, right, I mean, you kind of have to be and not to say that's wrong, like nothing's wrong with that. But now you live clearly you live a life that's more from heart and from intuition and just being with the flow like surfing, right? I bet you like surfing is the last thing that you can really analyze because there's so, <laughs> many, so many variables that you can't like, be like, well, if I take this 15 foot wave, there's a 5% chance I'm going to crash my head and hit, like, you just have to be in the flow, right? Exactly. It's catching the wave. I mean, it's, uh, it's being able to be fluid enough. And it's also, you know, uh, just like anything else, like, uh, you know, in, in, in operating on intuition, sometimes you just feel it. Um, mm -hmm. And then one, uh, one question that's coming to my mind, Davidson, is, uh, how do you distinguish between emotions and intuition? Um, well, I mean, I, I definitely think I'm very emotion based in general, um, but I, I think they're not necessarily different from each other. You know, like if I do things from my heart, 
it always works out like always you know like there was never a time where i'm like oh i'm gonna be a good person and make that person smile and and that led to something bad okay actually i take that back there's been times when i have disrespected others boundaries because my affection and my you know some people have like don't like affection so there are times where it's made people uncomfortable you know that i'm acknowledging them so much but 99 percent of the time like it works out and they're like, Oh my God, like, like Dave's in like, you're awesome. You just made my day, you know? Um, but I think intuition is um, knowing, like trusting that I think intuition for me, is kind of like faith, like faith in the sense that trust the process, things will always work out because for me, like things have never not worked out in the long run. Like when I took the 30,000 foot view, it's always worked out yeah. during the moment though. I'm like, crap in my pants or I'm like, oh my God, why did I join? That's powerful. But it always works out. Like 90. Can you give us an example? Use an example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like with my YouTube channel at the first couple of times, I was like, oh my God, my face, like I got to, you know, like my hair is messed up and my shirt's wrinkly. Like, I was, you know, you're just like, shit. You're just, just, just critical. Like, but then after, I looked at the last stats. It was like 330,000 or 330 hours watched from people. And I was like, wow, like this, wow. this worked out. This is the one thing I was afraid of most in my life. Like this worked out, you know? That, that's an incredible story. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I think uh, that applies to anyone, right? Someone who's trying, wanting to get started. You're going to make mistakes. Things are not going to be the best, but trust that, in the long term, it's always going to work out as long as you believe that doing something in line with your values. Hmm. Love that. Yeah, I mean, on that note, like, what are some of your core values and how did you determine it? Like, did, were you always grounded and did you always know it? Or was that more <laughs> evolved over time? No, I have no idea what values are until I joined the ITAC. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, it, before I joined IPAC, my goal was to become a C- chief technology officer of a company. And that's because, you know, if you're an engineer, that's the highest position you can blow up to, right? And, and so I wanted to learn technologies. I wanted to get an MBA. I'd research what you need to do. I would go to the seminars and ask the chief technology officers, hey, what do I need to do in order to become be like you, right? And... Um, and I tried all of those things. I tried learning, become an awesome coder. I tried getting into an MBA, uh, re- a good B school. I wrote my GMAT. None of them ever worked out um, because I think, uh, I think I didn't know myself and uh, I didn't know what my values are. Uh, because, um, but when I tapped into my values, I realized my top values are connection. The first thing I need to have is like being connected with people, um, just having, you know, having someone like you, Davidson, whom I can speak to about anything I want. I don't have to fill it myself. Um, and, and be supported, uh, someone who's fun uh, to, to be around with. Um, I, I think that those two are my top values, like connection and fun. Everything else is, is, is secondary. And when, since I knew that, um, I, every decision I made, comes from my values. Can I experience connection uh, by doing this and fun by doing this? Uh, so when it comes to even making videos, right? You know, connection. I'm, I'm connecting with people by being in the video, uh, and um, and it's it's fun to me. It just just um, you know the process is super fun to me. And being even staying in Puerto Rico, that's a huge decision. I mean, uh, love the people, experience the connection, fun. Um, it's it's just super fun, you know, to be surfing and uh, you know, uh, swimming and doing a lot of bunch of activities around the area. I'm curious, what a, what about the Puerto Rican people? Can Americans take in and implement into <laughs> to be you know? Clear? Good question, dude. Yeah, you know, Puerto Rico is it's, it's super relaxed. Is a uh, is is a very laid back uh, you know island. And, you know, one of the famous phrases I heard from someone, you know, my friend was telling me, you know, her car broke down and there's a, there's a guy who came down to help her out and he was a complete stranger. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he, and she was telling that, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, she was concerned that, you know, he's taking his time and he goes like, 
don't worry, I'm Puerto Rican. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> right? So th that's, I mean, that's the foundation of uh, being a Puerto Rican. I think it, it's just being laid back. Uh, and, and you see just, you see people on the beach. Uh, they just, you know, sit on the beach. I mean, I see them, you know, sometimes I go surfing, right? You know, during the week, this every day, their activity is come sit on the beach, drink beers. That's it. They're retired. They're young. They're retired. That's what they do. Uh, however, in America, it's like, all right, what are your goals? Where are you getting next? You know, you know, how are we crushing the competition? How do we stay ahead? It's it's all driven by the future and 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 uh, something uh, out there. Puerto Ricans, I think, they're just happy with uh, what they have. I mean, and, and that's the primary difference. Mm. And I also want to tell you uh, one other thing. There is also a downside of it. Mm. Uh, the downside is that nothing in Puerto Rico works in, on time, right? But someone tells you uh, they will come at 11 o'clock. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's really up to them. They might come at <laughs> one o'clock, two o'clock, and they might not even show up and you call them. They, they have no sense of apology, uh -huh. uh, it's kind of a thing. So it's very frustration. It could be very frustrating when, when you're coming from America to Puerto Rico. Um, uh, because uh, because it's a laid back. You can't expect people to be on time, everything to be running on time. That's also one of the downsides of it. I think Vietnamese culture is also like that. Like, I don't think my mom and my family has ever showed up on time for anything ever. Like <laughs> for my wedding, I told them an hour early and, and it was the one <laughs> where they actually showed up on time. And I was like, oh, I, I, I didn't expect you to get there so early because <laughs> that's fine. hour late, you know? So, uh, yeah, that, I, uh, that's interesting. So, so it sounds like, so how do you have like a, like a balance, you know, like how does one kind of be like adaptive and go with the flow so like you don't get stressed out when someone's half an hour late but you know you're also able to like get stuff done you know and have like what landmarkians call integrity <laughs> great question man um i i have been thinking about this a lot too I, I, and i think here is the thing right you know it's hard uh, to have a sense of balance uh, between integrity versus just being laid back and I think it's about uh, just committing, right? You know, for me, I, again, everyone has different perspectives. For me, what has been working is um, committing that for the next three months, I'm gonna accomplish this particular goal, right? During that three months, follow what Landmark teaches about integrity, follow the American principle uh, about, you know, wanting to get somewhere wanting to and there's nothing wrong with it right it, because it always helps you become a better person if you have goals and a vision and you're working towards it um, and pushing yourself towards it and there is also and that but that cannot uh, be for i mean depending on person to person uh, it just becomes too tiring so some at some point so for me i think three month goals work great and sometimes i'd create 15 days goals whatever that is for you right so create a goal and pursue it uh, with with that heart, with, with that mental grit of Michael Jordan, get it done. You know, get it done with um, uh, all your passion uh, and and win, right? And so that's perfect. Um, uh, so, but once after that, just turn it off. You, you know, turn it off, saying that I'm going to be laid back. But for the next three months, I'm going to take off. I'm gonna, not going to do anything on time. I'm not going to wake up on time. I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm a, I'm just going to go with the flow. So, and, and, and then even then you cannot be in that zone, you may not be in that zone for too long. So, so it's really figuring out what works for you. It's, it's figuring out, figuring out when uh, being laid back uh, is, is not working out for you. And then turning that switch back, back on again. I, I love what you said, because then you can, you're, you're experimenting, right? You're saying like, okay, to be results oriented, to be very like focused, like what, what light, what life, what does that life look like? And then trying the other way where you're more, you know, and then see what that's like. And then, yeah, I think that's really smart. Cause I think a lot of times, like we just hear what people say, but we don't take the time to check in 
okay, what works for me? Cause I'm different. So that that's a really good advice. Thanks, man. Thank you. And uh, um, writing a book, um, what, uh, yeah, would you like to share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, talking about having goals, right? I think that's perfect uh, timing that you brought up that question. Uh, I always wanted to write a book. It's it's a book about, uh, you know, I know, based on my experience coaching many engineers and also the <clears throat> the training I got through IPEC coach training program. So I combined my knowledge from that program and also my experience in coaching many engineers and uh, came up with the book. I think the title of the book is going to be um, going from an engineer's perspective, going from thriving or sur- going from surviving to thriving more. more. Uh, that's the title of the book. And that's something I've always wanted to write for a long time. Um, uh, but, but again, I haven't been taking action, right? I, I, I was having this Puerto Rican mindset. Maybe I should say that. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that, that might become too racist because it's not all Puerto Rican, so you can't generalize it, but it, it's having that laid back mindset. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Right. It never gets done. So I adopted this American mindset, like get it done. Right, which which is uh, that. So I created this 15 day goals, and I've written a book in 15 days. And and I for 15 days every day I was like writing 3,000 to 4,000 words. That was my daily target. Hit the goal, and uh, I'll be releasing the book um, in April next year. Uh, so so yeah. Awesome. If you need a testimonial or like a blurb or anything, let me know. I could definitely hook you up with one. I got you. Of course. Thanks, brother. Well, thank you so much, Aditya. I really appreciate your friendship. um, And I want to acknowledge you for just like laughter and joy. Uh, You you always know how to like make someone feel super awesome all the time. Like you're really good at um, seeing the essence of of a human being. And you always light up the room. Like you're always... Like when people are around you, they 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 just feel like a million bucks, a million bucks richer. Like whatever your net worth is, just add a million, and that's what happens. Like when you're hanging out with Aditya, and yeah, man, I really appreciate our friendship. And every time I talk to you, like I'm always laughing, I'm always smiling, I'm always giggling like a little girl, you know. <laughs> you know, you know what? I'll tell you this: I, and everyone is not going to get the same experience from me because it's not for it cannot be forced, right? Uh, and I, I can only be myself in certain people's presence. And, and you are one of those very few people where, where I can be myself. And, you know, it's just like, it's, it's both ways. I can uh, I, I authentically feel, you know, feel that. Uh, and there are very few friends um, who, whom, with whom I experience this. So not everyone. I can make everyone feel like a million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but that can be true uh, if uh, if I'm hanging out with certain people and, and I don't know why uh, it's hard. So, yeah, but we'll wrap up with I, I do think there's something to be said there, because now that I hear you say that, I, I, I definitely think there's certain times where in corporate America, like where I'm. I wouldn't be as uh, silly or as goofy, you know, like some, <laughs> I live I live down like 20 percent or so, you know. And then, you know, with my friends, like, yeah, I see what you're saying. I like hearing you. I'm like, oh, right. Even there's certain instances where I'm not like a hundred, a hundred percent authentic because sometimes I do and I get my hand slapped or I get in trouble. So I'm like, hmm, okay. Note to self. Don't- <laughs> environment. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right, brother. Thank you again for this opportunity to be on your show. It's a pleasure. I just feel proud uh, of of having you as a friend. So uh, you're doing amazing things. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can we can uh, I can interview more in the future episodes. Cool, man. Good. Have fun with your your LinkedIn Live with your lovely wife. And uh, yeah, uh, tell her. Thank us- you, brother. <laughs> Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.